Okay, right, so we're going to continue on with our talk of nephrology. Um, you guys remember why patients with chronic kidney disease have uh, bone disorders, mineral problems? Vitamin D is a problem. Calcium is a problem. What else is a problem? Phosphate is going to be a problem, right? Because what happens when calcium and phosphate get together? They love each other very much and they like to precipitate out uh, into the tissues, right? Uh, it's one of the big things you worry about. And also, what's, what's the problem with vitamin D in these patients? Hmm? Yeah, so it's hard for the patient to actually produce their own active vitamin D. So, uh, again, where does the last step of vitamin D activation occur? In the kidneys. So if that doesn't occur, then you can't have any active form. Thus, uh, you're going to have less calcium being absorbed through the GI tract. You're going to have parathyroid levels start to go up and increase parathyroid hormone levels. Do what? Yeah, so they, they're trying to increase blood calcium levels by taking from the bone. So they're going to have more bone demineralization. So that's where they get that renal osteodystrophy we've been talking about. Also, they can't, they have like impaired phosphate excretion in these patients. And so that's going to be another thing that we're going to look at. Um, hopefully, either bind up phosphates in the GI tract um, or to help eliminate it a little bit better. Um, <clears throat> so again, you can have... Um, the, the goals here when we're treating these patients are hopefully to normalize uh, these parameters and hopefully to prevent any of these detrimental consequences we were kind of alluding to. Um, so the bone manifestations, we'd like to keep the bones nice and strong if possible, uh, prevent any of these kind of uh, extravascular calcifications from occurring. Also, you worry about, uh, in the cardiovascular sense, you know, a lot of these atherosclerotic plaques and things like that, if you have those calcifications kind of building up on there, that could potentially provide some uh, increased blockage. Um, you also see increased mortality and, and morbidity with these patients. We'd like to decrease that if we can. And then we want to keep the calcium and phosphate in a relatively normal range. So that usually means we want to keep that calcium and phosphate product less than 55. And again, that's just uh, multiplying the two together, calcium times your phosphate. It's not ionized calcium, but the total calcium you can multiply together. Um, and then you'd also be monitoring their PTH levels as well to make sure that's being kept uh, somewhat in check. Obviously, uh, for these patients, normally it would be high or low. Should be high, right? So because there's not enough calcium in the blood, because it's trying, there's not enough vitamin D, uh, PTH is, is going to be ramped up because the parathyroid uh, thinks there's not enough calcium and vitamin D around. So it says, okay, we need more, you know, calcium mineralized from the bones. So it's going to release more PTH, right? Um, so very similar to how you would see like TSH be high in someone who's hypothyroid, very similar to that. So um, looking at some non-pharmacologic therapy we can do for these patients, the first thing we should do is restrict their phosphate intake. And so um, this is going to be the first line management for a hyperphosphatemia. This is normally the thing that kind of first uh, presents because the high, uh, high phosphate levels are going to start to bind up the calcium and then you see hypocalcemia after that. But uh, basically, if we can um, try to get these patients to run uh, 800 to 1,000 milligrams of phosphate a day, um, that would be the goal. But that's kind of tough because also um, these patients, you worry about them being malnourished. They have, um, you know, especially the albumin levels being low and things like that. Like you worry about protein um, uh, supplementation. So that can be very difficult to kind of balance out between the phosphate levels that you want to keep down and then the actual protein you want the patients to absorb because protein is high in. Phosphates, absolutely. Okay. <coughs> See, some of you guys are still coming back from spring break. It's okay. Um, so anyway, so other things you can find that are high in phosphates are going to be your dairy products, uh, peanut butter, nuts, um, colas, beer, things like that. So those would be all foods you uh, probably want to keep uh, in some limitation for these patients. Um, and again, these patients are going to have, especially dialysis patients uh, in general, are going to have higher protein requirements anyway. Um, usually 1.2 to 1.3 grams per kilogram per day is kind of where you're treating for for those patients. But um, dialysis is not super great at pulling off phosphorus, so that is kind of one of the problems here is that even though it's good for pulling off other electrolytes, phosphorus does not get pulled off very well. So restriction is going to be one of the better things we can do for those patients. And in some cases, you may even do parathyroidectomy and just remove those completely um, for patients who aren't really responding to anything else. Okay. But uh, we do have some drugs, and so what we can do are going to be phosphate binders. And so these are working um, to help bind up uh, phosphates that are coming in the GI tract, bind them up, prevent them from being absorbed in the first place. So um, as we mentioned before, calcium and phosphate like each other very much, and so we can actually get some calcium-based products to help bind up this phosphate. So things like calcium carbonate, which you can find most often in things like Tums, are usually the cheapest, easiest thing to go with. So that's usually one of the first uh, things we'll start with. Um, there's some other products like calcium acetate or Foslo. Again, yeah, that makes kind of sense based on, on what it's trying to do, the, the brain name there. So try to get your uh, phosphate levels down. Um, again, that one's going to be a prescription product. Um, so if like the Tums really aren't working, um, this might be another product you can get for your patients um, to, to, you know, with a prescription so they can get those phosphate levels down.
And then you have a couple other ones, things like Savellamer carbonate or Lanthanum carbonate, um, this is Lin Rinvella and Phosronol. Um, these are um, also going to be very effective at lowering down your, your phosphorus levels. So uh, especially if they have hypercalcemia, this would be a good case to use one of these other drugs instead of um, you know, adding on more calcium to them. So um, especially if they're having any kind of um, calcifications, any evidence of that, like these are better drugs to go with because again, you're not giving them extra calcium at that point. Um, so probably further on in therapy, you know, when the disease is a little bit more progressed, you kind of move on to things like the Rinval or the Fosrenol. Um, again, why do we want to take these with meals? That's when, yeah, that's when the phosphate is going to be entering in the GI tract. That's the best time you're going to get uh, the most bang for your buck uh, from that standpoint. Um, sometimes they will use aluminum hydroxide, and so this is um, not used quite as frequently anymore, uh, mainly because for some of these patients, um, they can have aluminum uh, buildup. Normally, it's eliminated renally, uh, but for these patients that have poor renal function, they're going to kind of build that up, and dialysis will not pull it off either, so they can have uh, neurotoxicity related to that. So um, normally, we'll try to hold off on aluminum, uh, or maybe you just use it for kind of short courses for these patients. Is it a gel? Um, it does not actually come as a gel. I'm not sure. I think it forms a gel within the, the GI tract. Um, that's why it gets that name. Yeah. But again, where else would you find aluminum hydroxide? Hmm? Uh, I don't know if it is found. Yeah. Maybe. Well, yeah, aluminum is oftentimes found in, in antiperspirants and things like that. Um, but you find it in, in GI preparations. So think like your Maloxes, where it's aluminum and magnesium hydroxide being put together, right? Um, so think about you know other places you might actually see those, those drugs being used. So um, looking at the calcium-based agents, um, these are going to be better in early CKD when the patients are likely hypocalcemic. So again, they're kind of losing a lot of calcium either to the phosphate or in, in the kidneys. Uh, because again, uh, normally you will see that uh, vitamin D and, and PTH are going to help to increase calcium reabsorption. And so when those go down, you're going to start to see more of it being uh, released to the kidneys. But um, you're going to find that uh, a lot of these need to be given prior to meals so that way they can absorb uh, either get absorbed a little bit better or they're going to be able to bind up that phosphorus a little bit better. Um, you'll find that some of them are going to have, uh, you know, uh, some issues with, you know, changing your lipids around. So just be aware of that because probably these patients are going to have some other comorbidities um, that can be uh, influenced by that. Uh, but again, aluminum is usually just kind of held off for short term therapy if they're not responding to other agents. So GI effects are going to be the biggest thing you're looking for for these guys. Um, so again, just like anytime you give calcium, you worry about. Yeah, constipation is going to be a big thing here. So I worry about that, especially like aluminum, you might see some um, uh, constipation with that again as well, which is why you usually kind of mix it with the magnesium hydroxide because that's more likely to cause diarrhea. Um, but a lot of uh, GI uh, issues from that. The hypercalcemia obviously is going to be more related back to the calcium-based products. And then I mentioned that aluminum toxicity, really going to be for more chronic usage for patients that have really poor kidney function. So um, other things, uh, drug food or drug drug interactions you want to worry about, especially with calcium. Uh, salts are going to be binding up other oral medications. So if they're on uh, things like iron, and, and what's another problem with a lot of these CKD patients? They're anemic, right? So they need their iron. So um, that can be bound up. So you worry about that. You know, fluoroquinolones can be bound up because they may be more prone to infections, especially if they have like indwelling dialysis catheters and things like that that can make them more prone to it. So um, think about things like that. Um, and then usually you can separate your agents out, either use them one hour before or say like three hours, two or three hours after um, in order to make sure you avoid those interactions. <coughs> Okay, um, next looking at, at vitamin D therapy, we've kind of talked about this uh, previously, but uh, the ergo and the cholecalciferol have to be converted by the kidney. So if that's not occurring, then we can't really use those agents very well. So that's where the calcitriol is going to be our main um, agent that we're going to be using here because it's that 125 dihydroxy version. It's already activated, ready to go. Um, and this is going to be useful because it helps to stimulate uh, calcium reabsorption, uh, but it's also going to suppress that PTH secretion. So this will be useful in trying to drive down those PTH levels uh, for those patients. So, uh, but it will cause some uh, increase in, in calcium levels and in phosphate levels. So, um, you know, with more progressive disease, you're going to be seeing that calcium phosphate product start to creep up for these patients when you give them vitamin D supplementation. But it's kind of one of those kind of necessary evils um, you're having to deal with there. You may give a drug called paracalcitol or Zimplar, which actually um, works to activate the parathyroid hormone receptors, um, but it doesn't actually increase calcium or phosphate absorption. It's kind of like... Um, 
kind of like tr uh, mimicking vitamin D to try to uh, trick the PTH in, in, into secreting less uh, hormone. Um, and so that is useful because it doesn't actually act like vitamin D does uh, and increase calcium and phosphate reabsorption. So sometimes you use that in more kind of really progressive um, patients uh, with really poor kidney function. Uh, and there's another drug called Senecalcid or Sensipar. This one will actually uh, sensitize the parathyroid hormone receptors uh, to the effects of calcium. So whatever calcium is there is going to be uh, being a little bit more effective in helping to reduce those PTA secretions. Um, so this is, again, good for patients who are more progressive. Um, we're starting to have some of that bone demineralization start to occur, more risk for osteoporosis. This is a good drug to help um, try to get those PTA levels down. Okay, um, so that's it for kind of managing kind of the chronic issues with uh, chronic kidney disease. So we talked about the anemia and how we need to treat that. Um, what kind of forms of iron do we normally give first in these patients? Parasulfate's a good one. That's usually how uh, given by which route. Oral. Mm -hmm. What does it do to your feces? Yeah, it turns it black, right? Okay. Um, what are other ways we can give iron? Yeah, there's IV form, parenteral forms, right? So think about things like your iron sucrose, uh, uh, iron ferrous gluconate, you know, things like that. So um, those are uh, all good products to give for patients who have a uh, poor absorption through the GI tract or have kind of chronic anemia. So you give them a dose of IV iron, and that way the bioavailability is very good because normally through the GI tract, it's usually pretty poor for the most part. So that can be a good option for them. Um, obviously, sometimes they need transfusions, uh, but what's another way to get their uh, hemoglobin up? You can give blood. What's another way to do it uh, synthetically? EPO. Yeah, you can give EPO or give um, EPOETIN. We can give uh, Darby Poetin. Right? Those are good agents in order to help um, kind of stimulate their natural erythropoiesis because, again, their kidneys are not producing enough erythropoietin on their own. So that's another way to get their, their hemoglobin back up, right? What's one of the dangers of giving those drugs, though? They get too many. They get too many. Cells. Too many red blood cells, right? You don't want to drive their hemoglobin up too high because they're at risk for DVT, strokes, clots, like, because the blood ends up kind of sludging up a little bit, gets more viscous as you drive that hemoglobin up, gets more concentrated. Um, so normally, um, you know, they would try to drive it at hemoglobin to like, you know, levels of 13, something like that to be kind of what it would be normal. Um, but we don't want to do that. Usually 10 or 11 is kind of our cut point for where we're, we're kind of um, looking to the sweet spot for our therapy and try to keep the patients there. Okay, so uh, it's a black box warning for those drugs. So it's really important for them to uh, not get that uh, hemoglobin up too high. Okay, uh, moving forward, we'll talk about drug-induced kidney injury since uh, lots of different drugs can cause kidney injury, and we'll see some ways uh, how that occurs and then some ways we can hopefully prevent that or treat it. So, um, some of the manifestations you can see, so say a patient is in the ICU, say they are uh, in the hospital and you are looking for signs they may have some degree of drug-induced kidney injury. Some of the things that you can actually look for are going to be things like new onset acid-base abnormalities, you know, without the presence of other kind of... Um, good reasons for that to occur. You see electrolyte imbalances, uh, start to see some urine sediments start to form, like that could be another sign of that. And then, you know, things like hematuria, proteinuria, anything that's kind of abnormal, um, which you can see certainly in other causes of kidney injury uh, can occur here, but usually it's going to be coinciding with the initiation uh, of a new drug, usually for the most part. But most commonly, you're going to see decreases in GFR as being kind of the first sign uh, that we see with that. But again, how long does it take for your GFR to uh, start to decrease after the injury occurs? Is it instant? Right, because serum creatinine has to get up to its new steady state, so it takes time for that to occur, a few days or so. Um, so another way, uh, thing we can look at, uh, which is instantaneous, is with the urine output, right? So you can measure the urine output to make sure that's staying uh, pretty stable, that it starts to diminish pretty dramatically. You know that, hey, there's probably something going on here, and then the serum creatinine will kind of catch up, and your GFR will go down uh, within a few days or so, okay? Uh, so keep in mind, urine output is always a really good thing to measure uh, for your patients, if you can, to, to monitor their renal function. Because remember what kind of a normal adult kind of urine output is? So anywhere between like 0.5 to 1 ml per kilo per hour is usually a pretty good uh, number. Usually like for kids, we're looking at at least 1 ml per kilo per hour, but they can certainly go well above that. Um, that's kind of our, our minimums there we like to keep. Okay, um, so, anyway, so we see that uh, drug-induced kidney injury is a big problem for a lot of patients. Up to 20% uh, of hospital admissions can be related back to some degree of acute kidney injury. Um, 
or admissions that are due to acute kidney injury are you know, 20% uh, related back to drugs in, in, in these cases. Um, and if you have acute kidney injury that's in the hospital, uh, about 60% of those are related back to drugs. Um, so we can see things like antibiotics being uh, big ones to, to cause this. Do you guys remember any antibiotics that cause kidney injury? I mean, glycosides are a big one. And, you know, sometimes vancomycin can be playing a role here. So um, antibiotics are big ones. NSAIDs, obviously, uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, a lot of our chemo agents, which we'll talk about. Do you guys remember any chemo agents that can cause? Displat is a good one. All of your platinum-based agents. Anything else? Mm, possibly. They like methotrexate, you know, other drugs like that. So lots of chemo drugs that can do this. Uh, and then a lot of our antivirals, so things like acyclovir and cause, you know, uh, crystal depositions in, in the renal tubules. So lots of different drugs that can be involved in this. And so uh, if you have a patient who is in the hospital who's very, very sick, um, they're already at risk for kidney injury anyway. Uh, and then you're adding on new kind of insult to injury. Uh, so you're adding on more drugs that can just uh, further progress this. So, um, again, most common uh, manifestation of this is going to be a rise in the uh, serum creatinine and probably the BUN as well. And then we're going to see a decline in the GFR. Okay. Um, keep in mind uh, that you can have uh, renal tubular dysfunction uh, without a loss of GFR. And so the best way that was described to me uh, was that the patient has dumb kidneys, right? Uh, so they're still able to produce urine. They're still able to, to make the fluid and get rid of creatinine, but they can't really regulate uh, reabsorption and secretion of lots of other things. So they may still see uh, build up a BUN. Uh, you may still see um, drug levels not uh, being uh, eliminated as effectively as they should because the kidneys aren't really working as effectively. The renal tubules this will pass fluid through, but they're not really able to, to regulate a lot of that stuff. Uh, so we call them dumb kidneys uh, when they're still producing urine. But uh, other symptoms you can see with that, obviously, you know, if they have like edema, shortness of breath, you know, vomiting, anorexia, all those can be signs uh, of uh, you know, new onset acute kidney injury for these patients. But um, other big things you're looking for are going to be that decrease in urine output, uh, especially if they have any progression of hypertension along with this or a fluid overload. So you can certainly see this with um, contrast-induced nephropathy, uh, say after uh, an imaging study. Um, NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors can all do this. Um, and then if you're looking for proximal tubular injury, this is where you can see some issues with things like uh, metabolic acidosis because they end up spilling a lot of bicarb. Uh, you see glycosuria, hyperphosphatemia, all those kind of things. Um, basically just increasing a lot of urinary losses of, of electrolytes and other things. And then for more uh, distal tubular injury, um, normally you're gonna be seeing uh, the polyurea is related to the inability to really concentrate the urine effectively. Um, and you can actually see a metabolic acidosis here from uh, this impaired acidification of the urine itself. And then hyperkalemia will also develop, okay? In some cases you may have uh, depletion of electrolytes. In some cases you may see buildup of other ones, depending on where the injury is actually occurring uh, within the kidney. So um, things that are causing acute tubular necrosis, uh, things like aminoglycosides. Um, some of our high osmolarity radiographic contrast media can do this. It's what we call the contrast-induced nephropathy. Um, cisplatin, carboplatin are big ones. Um, amphotericin B, do you guys remember what we use amphotericin B for? Yeah, fungal infections are yeah, where we're going to use that. Um, usually like really invasive fungal infections. Um, cyclosporin or tacrolimus, do you guys know where you might use those? Um, cyclosporin in the eye, as that restasis. Sometimes you actually use those, in, and those are immunosuppressants, so you use those in transplant patients. Or if you have patients who have like autoimmune conditions, sometimes you'll see it used to help, um, you know, they have like you know, lupus nephritis or other things like that. Like you can sometimes use that to tamp down the, the immune system. Um, and then you have your some of your uh, antiviral agents, things like adefavir, sedafavir, can all cause this acute tubular necrosis. Uh, pentamidine is a drug that we'll sometimes use uh, for patients who are uh, at risk for PCP. Uh, you guys remember PCP? Right, where do you, what type of patients do you see that in? HIV, HIV patients, also um, sometimes your chemo patients are, are uh, uh, immunosuppressed. Sometimes we'll use that as an alternative to Bactrim. Say if they have like a really bad allergy and they couldn't receive that, then we'll give them pentamidine instead. Um, Foscarnet's another uh, antiviral agent you might see being used. And then uh, Zoldronate, which, uh, where do we see that at? Bisphosphonate. It's a bisphosphonate used for osteoporosis, right? <laughs> um, so those are all things that can cause acute tubular necrosis for these patients. So um, other types of kidney injury we can see occurring due to drugs. You can have osmotic nephrosis that can occur. This is usually due to um, high osmolarity agents that are usually drawing a lot of fluids uh, to them. So things like mannitol, which you'll sometimes see being used um, both as an osmotic diuretic, but also more frequently, you'll see it being used for things like traumatic head injuries where it can help to draw fluid off of the, uh, through the blood brain barrier and off of the head. Um, things like uh, sugar-based solutions like dextrans and then IV immunoglobulins sometimes do this as well. 
Uh, and then you can also have some hemodynamically mediated kidney injury. Things like ACE inhibitors and ARBs are going to be big for this one because you guys remember, um, do they affect the, the afferent or the efferent arterial of the kidneys? ACEs usually affect the efferent, right? They're heading away from the kidneys because they are causing what to occur? Because vasodilation, right? Because you're inhibiting ANG2. ANG2 is usually a, a potent vasoconstrictor, so you're you know, we're losing some of that backflow pressure uh, essentially on, on the glomerulus. And then things like NSAIDs are working on the yeah. afferent arterial, and they inhibit the production of prostaglandins, prostaglandins which are? Prostaglandins are usually vasodilatory. So again, if you're uh, diminishing the amount of prostaglandins available, you're going to see vasoconstriction of that afferent arterial, and that's less fluid to actually be making it to the glomerulus, right? Um, so those are all going to be hemodynamically mediated uh, kidney injuries. Usually it's going to be presenting as kind of a pre-renal um, kind of uh, look to it. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus can also do this as well. So um, in some cases, you may have an obstructive nephropathy. This is going to be more related to things um, causing intratubular obstruction. So if drugs are able to kind of precipitate out um, based on, say, like the acidity or based on uh, dehydration, things like that, you can see things like acyclovir causing a crystal urea, uh, sulfonamide, so things like uh, um, sulfamethoxazole, which you find in Bactrim, uh, some other antiviral agents, and the methotrexate is a big one. So methotrexate is actually a chemo drug we will give with lots of sodium bicarbonate because it actually helps to uh, alkalinize the urine, helps to prevent uh, the drug from precipitating out. So it's a very common drug you're going to see given with methotrexate. Um, not so much for things like rheumatoid arthritis because you're usually giving uh, smaller doses for those patients, but chemo patients for sure, getting grams and grams of methotrexate for things like leukemia, those patients will definitely get it. Um, and then some drugs uh, will cause nephrolithiasis, so things like sulfonamides, uh, triamterine. Do you guys remember what type of drug that is? It was a potassium sparing diuretic back in, we were talking about hypertension, right? Um, so that was one that uh, can cause uh, nephrolithiasis, and then indenivir is another uh, antiviral agent. So again, don't memorize these lists necessarily. We'll talk about some of, uh, some of the more common ones in more detail and some of the ways we can help to prevent this. But just be aware that there's lots of different varieties of kidney injury that can occur by lots of different types of drugs. Again, so if anytime you are um, noticing a patient's having you know, uh, an acute rise in their, in their serum creatinine, like look at the drug list to see what could have been else, uh, what else could have been going on, what new drugs have been added on, is there any kind of drug-drug interactions where they could be kind of worsening one another. So just be aware of that and be cognizant and, and look at that med list. Um, some drugs will cause glomerular disease, so you can see things like gold-based products, which where would we use gold at? Yeah, so rheumatoid arthritis is really kind of old school drugs used to use for RA. Um, lithium can do this as well, which we use lithium for? Bipolar disorder. Um, NSAIDs and the pimidronate. Uh, pimidronate is actually a drug we'll sometimes use for, for hypercalcemia. Um, and then sometimes you actually have some allergic uh, interstitial nephritis that can occur. Um, and again, this is going to be back related to actual the drug allergies, IgE related. Um, so things like penicillins, uh, uh, superfloxacin. Usually you don't see this too, too commonly, but it certainly can occur. Uh, just be another route uh, of injury. Um, some drugs will cause a vasculitis and thrombosis, so things like, uh, this is especially important when you think about things like hydralazine, um, because hydralazine oftentimes will also cause what? What kind of unique side effect does hydralazine have? Because it's like a lupus-like rash, right? So it can cause this vasculitis that can occur, um, which can also affect the kidneys as well. So sometimes you can have like a, a thrombosis that can occur there due to this vasculitis. Um, remember, hydralazine is used normally for... Used to lower blood pressure. It's a vasodilator, right? So you, sometimes you'll use that um, to help get the blood pressure down. Um, and then the other thing to remember is that it is also uh, metabolized. Um, I don't remember the the acetylation uh, pathway. So again, you have poor acetylators. Um, they'll actually end up having uh, higher drug levels of that, and so it's going to help to build up uh, and cause some problems there. So those are your patients that are more at risk with that. But things like amphetamines, cyclosporin, allopurinol can all cause uh, some vasculitis as well. Also, and for that one patient uh, who we ended up seeing the uh, uh, all those clots and everything, one of the things we're thinking about because uh, things like amphetamines can cause um, activation of clotting cascades, especially through platelets and whatnot, that's also one of the things we're kind of entertaining. Is like, okay, could this be drug based? Could it be something like that? Some kind of stimulant based? Um, you know, didn't really fit the picture uh, for that particular patient, but it's something also to keep in mind. Um, and then some drugs can cause like some cholesterol embolizes. Again, pretty rare, but uh, things like warfarin or other thrombolytic agents could potentially do this as well. So, um, 
So some of these drugs will end up causing uh, tubular epithelial cell damage. So again, they're going to have direct cellular toxicity or they're going to be causing ischemia to the tissue. Um, and again, most frequently, it's going to be kind of limited to more proximal or distal tubular epithelia. So normally, you're going to see the injury occurring there. Um, and when this happens, you're going to end up seeing uh, cellular degeneration and then they're going to have sloughing of the basement membrane. So again, this is where we're going to start to see some of those sediments start to build up. Um, and so if you have these uh, muddy brown uh, debris filled kind of granular cast like this is where you can normally uh, see that and think back to um, some of this epithelial cell damage that's occurring. Let's talk about some of the ways that, that can occur. But um, with acute tubular necrosis, this is going to be the most common uh, presentation for drug-induced kidney injury uh, for the inpatient setting. And the, the, these are some of the most frequently uh, implicated drugs you're going to see. So this is a good list to remember. We're going to be talking about more of these uh, in detail. But amino glycosides are a major player for this because, uh, again, usually we're using amino glycosides for patients um, who are having uh, infections and, and oftentimes sepsis. And again, when you have sepsis, what does your blood pressure do? It goes down, right? You get hypotensive. And then what does that do to blood flow to the kidneys? decreases it, right? Because again, your your heart wants to, or you know, you want to get blood flow going to the heart and the head. Uh, kidneys kind of take a backseat to that. So again, you're going to have hyperperfusion of the kidneys anyway. Now you're adding on nephrotoxic meds on top of that, right? So it can just, again, be adding insult to injury, uh, so to speak. Um, radio contrast media is going to be another big case. Uh, we're starting to get uh, more and more away from this, but this is another very important thing to be looking at when you're uh, considering sending a patient in to get contrast. Is like, what's their kidney function look like? Because these can cause uh, that nephropathy there. Uh, cisplatin is another big one. Infotericin B, as we'll mention. Uh, and then obviously things like phosphorinate and osmotically active agents like mannitol can all cause um, a direct acute tubular necrosis. So um, around 10 to 25 percent of patients receiving a therapeutic course of amino glycosides um, are going to develop some sort of acute tubular necrosis in about 58 percent of critically ill patients. So those are in the ICU, those are the, the septic patients that are on pressors, things like that. Those are all the patients that are going to be more at risk for having this uh, kidney injury due to amino glycosides. Um, usually it takes time for this to occur as the drug levels start to build up. Um, and so usually five to 10 days or so after therapy is when you're going to start to see, um, you know, urine output start to drop, so the GFR start to uh, drop as well, serum creatinine is going to start to go up there. Um, and generally, for the most part, when you have drug-induced kidney injury, it can be reversible if you eliminate the offending agent. Okay, There's nothing we can do to directly reverse it or to make it better, um, but we can at least stop further injury from occurring. And then typically, the patient is able to kind of pick up the slack and is able to kind of reverse a lot of this injury that's happening there. Okay, um, So it's one of those things where we can either change our dosing pattern or just stop the drug completely in order to help uh, prevent uh, further injury from occurring. So um, this is primarily when you have the aminoglycosides, the injury is primarily due to high drug levels uh, or when you have accumulation of it. So uh, for instance, if you started a patient on, say, a given dose of aminoglycoside that was appropriate for their renal function, and then they start to worsen, and the renal function starts to de uh, diminish, and then you never actually change your aminoglycoside dose, that can lead to accumulation, right? Um, say, for instance, you were to uh, have them on aminoglycoside and you started up an inset, and that diminished uh, kidney blood flow. Lots of different things that can interplay there to, to cause this injury to happen in the first place and cause accumulation of the drug. But um, basically, what, uh, when you have accumulation, you have high levels. What's happening here is that the, uh, the drugs themselves can cause these, uh, the generation of those reactive oxygen species, and that's going to start to damage the mitochondria, start to kill off some of these cells um, within the, the actual uh, renal tubules themselves. But um, some of the big risk factors you're going to be looking for uh, are going to include large total doses. So the bigger the dose, the more likely you are to see this. Um, longer therapies are going to be more likely to see this as well. And then if you have high trough concentration, so that's going to be one of the main things we're going to be doing when we do therapeutic drug monitoring, make sure the troughs don't get too high. Um, and then other concurrent nephrotoxins, things like NSAIDs, things like ACE inhibitors, things like vancomycin, all of this can potentially worsen your chances for developing this kidney injury. You guys remember why all the drugs fall into the aminoglycoside category? Genomycin, tobramycin, amicacin. Yeah, those are the three big ones that we use uh, clinically, at least IV, uh, for treatment of some of these uh, gram positive or gram negative infections. Negative, right? Again, these have good activity against pseudomonas, which is why we use these so frequently for uh, ICU patients. So um, first thing, uh, we'd like to do prevention if possible, because obviously we like to keep their kidney function as, as good as you can. Um, but one, uh, careful patient selection. So if they already have really poor kidney function, maybe try using something else uh, before going to immunoglycosides. Um, maybe using an alternative drug that has similar coverage uh, for gram-negative bugs like you would see with the immunoglycosides. 
Um, you can also try to limit other concurrent nephrotoxins. So if you can get some of their other drugs off their list, which may be uh, having an additive effect here, that would be beneficial. Um, and then we also want to do this prospective pharmacokinetic monitoring. This is probably the biggest thing we can do for our patients uh, to make sure that we are uh, assessing their renal function at baseline, uh, see what's going on there, and then we can adjust our dose and how frequently we're giving the drug in order to help prevent injury from occurring in the first place. And then the other big thing we've done is that previously we would use aminoglycosides every eight hours. Um, but if you remember back to our talks of antibiotics, uh, are they concentration or time dependent killers? They're concentration dependent killers, right? So you want to get their hot levels really high and they have that post antibiotic effect. So it really doesn't make sense to give it every eight hours. And so nowadays we very frequently will do once daily dosing where you give a big dose up front. Uh, and then by the time you would actually measure a level, say 18 hours later, it actually is very frequently going to be undetectable. But you're still having that post antibiotic effect, still killing off bacteria, and that's okay. You don't have to have detectable levels all the time like you would with a time dependent killer. So what this does is that it helps to reduce accumulation because basically by the time you measure a trough, it's undetectable, which is usually kind of the goal uh, from that standpoint. Uh, as far as treatment goes, the kidney injuries already occurred. The only thing you can do is basically stop therapy at that point. Okay. Um, moving on, uh, next we have radiographic contrast media induced uh, nephrotoxicity. Um, the incidence has been declining pretty steadily. I think people are getting to be more cognizant of this or screening their patients better and we're also hydrating them better um, prior to them getting uh, contrast. So, you know, it used to be around 15% of cases um, uh, related back to this has gone down to about 7% of those patients receiving contrast. So still very frequent cause of hospital acquired acute kidney injury, about 11% of cases there. Um, but uh, for patients who have normal kidney function to begin with, very low incidence of this. Very likely you're not really going to cause any lasting damage uh, to those patient's kidneys. But those that already have existing chronic kidney disease, very frequently you're going to uh, experience this, about 50% of those patients. Um, and then if you have a contrast-induced nephropathy, they found there's about a 5.5-fold increase in the risk of death for those patients. So this is something we really want to avoid as, as best we can uh, to prevent um, you know, any risk of further morbidity or mortality for these patients. Um, again, patients are, you know, usually this is going to be kind of more transient in nature and usually presents around 24 to 48 hours after they receive the contrast. Um, and then very frequently you're going to see oligura be one of the, the first kind of presenting signs or symptoms of this you're going to notice for your patients. So how does this occur? Um, basically, when you're giving these high osmotic uh, contrast agents, you're going to cause this renal ischemia and direct cellular toxicity. Uh, basically, you can end up seeing a 50% reduction in renal blood flow for several hours after the fact. Basically, you have the contrast circulating around. It draws so much fluid to it because there's a high osmolarity um, that ends up diminishing the kidney blood flow. And so that's where you see a lot of this damage occurring. That's where you see the, the hypoxic damage happening there. Um, again, this is where patients uh, or the, the contrast agents usually had anywhere between 600 to to 2,000 milliosms uh, per kilogram. Um, and normal, uh, you know, uh, human osmolarity is what? Yeah, right around 300 or so. So you can see how this became very concentrated, drew a lot of fluid to it, right? Because water likes to go from, or things like to go from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So it drew a lot of water in and diminished that renal blood flow. So that was a big problem there. And so patients, uh, the biggest ones at risk were those that had pre existing kidney disease uh, or anyone had kind of reduced renal blood flow. So one of the big things we're going to help to, uh, prevent this is to help uh, kind of improve their renal blood flow. And so that's where we're going to see hydration is so important for these patients. So again, assess risk factors for all of your patients. So as far as the contrast goes, you want to minimize the dose that you can use. Uh, so less contrast, the better. Um, you'll see that if you use non-iodinated contrast studies, um, that is going to be uh, beneficial for them. Right, so limiting how much contrast you're getting exposed to there. And if you have to use it, use lower isoosmolar contrast agents. I'm not going to go super in depth on those because um, uh, you guys probably won't be having to actually deal with what type of contrast agents they're going to be getting specifically. But um, just know that there are lower isoosmolar uh, agents that actually help to diminish uh, kidney injuries occurring there. So something closer to what the human blood actually uh, has there. Um, one of the big problems you run into, though, is you have patients who have concomitant nephrotoxins on board, um, which can uh, actually worsen their chances of developing this. But um, one of the things that we can do here uh, is to make sure we are giving them isotonic crystalloids around 3 to 12 hours prior to the contrast exposure and then usually continue it for 6 to 24 hours post-dose. Okay, so again, try to tank them up with lots of fluids beforehand to help kind of uh, uh, dilute the, the contrast agent that you're giving and then you hydrate them afterwards in order to help kind of make sure kidney blood flow is being maintained and you kind of uh, dilute out the, the contrast for that duration. That's usually the best thing we can do for them. Um, 
one of the big problems you ran into for a long time, especially with patients coming into like the ER um, who needed, uh, you know, contrast pretty acutely for, for scans, they have like PEs and things like that, is very frequently they would not monitor whether or not they were on metformin. That became a big problem because if you had a patient who had acute kidney injury, uh, all of a sudden their renal blood flow decreases, their GFR decreases, and now you're starting to build up metformin. Uh, what's one of the big problems with seeing, uh, seeing with that? The lactic acidosis start to develop from that. The metformin, metformin build up, that's why we don't give metformin in patients who have poor kidney function, uh, because you see that build up, you see lactic acidosis. So that was a big risk for those patients. Um, big one of the uh, one of the big things you want to scan for on the med list prior to giving them contrast. Um, some patients will try to. Uh, for high-risk patients, you may try to use some preventative therapies. There's not uh, a ton of evidence to say whether or not these are 100% effective or have any effect whatsoever, but these are some drugs you might give. So things like sodium bicarbonate uh, may help to diminish some of the free radical formation that occurs there by alkalizing uh, the urine. Uh, probably not a ton of uh, evidence to show benefit for that. Um, and then in the acetylcysteine or mucumis, we mentioned previously, um, you know, is a pretty cheap uh, and pretty safe agent uh, and maybe uh, reserved for kind of the highest risk patients for, for contrast-induced nephropathy. So like I mentioned, uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you guys or not, but we had um, a kid who was in the, the PICU uh, who really needed a scan. I don't, I don't remember what, what it was for, but he had very, uh, he was dialysis dependent. So he was basically getting hemodialysis three times a week. Um, so we need to go for contrast. And so the nephrologist, you know, obviously you're worried about diminishing kidney function even further. Um, and so basically the, at that point, the, the doc was like, well, let's go ahead and try mucumis. We gave it for basically a day beforehand and may, I think like two days afterwards. Um, whether or not it was effective, who, who can say, but again, it was a cheap, relatively safe med. It's one of those things we said, well, might as well just go ahead and try it. Um, it can't really cause any harm for this patient. So um, that's one patient we ended up using it for. But other than that, uh, management is going to be mainly supportive. So just make sure you kind of, um, you know, uh, some of the patients may have such a severe uh, diminishment of their, their renal function, may need things like dialysis intermittently. Uh, but for the most part, uh, just make sure you're getting fluids and, and um, kind of monitor them for the time uh, while their renal function is diminished. Okay, uh, another big drug that we're going to see causing acute tubular necrosis is going to be cisplatin. Uh, this is a widely used drug for a lot of different types of solid tumors, uh, but the major dose limiting problem here is going to be the nephrotoxicity. Um, essentially, uh, what you're going to be seeing here is that it causes a lot of drug accumulation to occur in those proximal tubules, uh, and it's going to cause damage to those cells, just like it causes damage to all other types of cells, right? Because um, Again, these are not super specific for uh, any type, particular type of cancer cells that's going to uh, affect all kinds of human cells. Um, but basically, what you're going to end up seeing is are going to have uh, what I call this dumb kidneys, where basically you see um, decreased ability to concentrate the urine, see impaired reabsorption, so you end up losing a, a lot of electrolytes, so you end up losing a lot of magnesium, uh, potassium, calcium, all, all related to this. Um, one of the ways you can do to help prevent this is, again, use lots and lots of fluids uh, in order to um, help make sure we have a good uh, blood flow to help kind of flush the, the cisplatin out as fast as we can. Um, obviously, you want to avoid other nephrotoxins. Um, again, look for those patients who already have poor kidney function, you may uh, be able to reduce the dose or decrease how frequently they're going to get the drug. Um, but here, uh, we use uh, vigorous hydration uh, with, uh, with normal saline, usually would say 12 to 24 hours uh, prior to therapy. Um, we'll get them a ton of fluids. So say, for instance, um, just to come to mind, like we have like an adolescent patient, say like the 13 or 14, who's getting cisplatin. Um, you know, normal fluid rate for them may be somewhere like say like 100 mL an hour. You know, depending on what the weight is, um, we'll be giving them say three or 400 mL an hour. So it's usually several times uh, their maintenance rate that we're giving them fluids and make sure we're hydrating the kidneys effectively. And then we'll go ahead and um, hydrate them for several days afterwards as well. So usually the goal is to get usually around three or four liters per day uh, of urine produced. Um, another thing you can possibly give as a kind of antidotal agent uh, is going to be amiphystine or ethoyl. Um, and basically, this actually chelates uh, cisplatin within uh, normal cells. And so basically, you would give it prior to initiation of the cisplatin uh, and actually helps to, to bind some of it up and prevents it from causing it to, its injury there. Um, don't use it super frequently, at least in, in the pediatric population, but sometimes it will be reserved for those that are really high-risk patients. Why? Hmm? Because it's more expensive, and if you can hydrate them, and that's... Uh, usually that's sufficient in order to help prevent the kidney injury. Um, you should go with that first. And then, you know, so if you already know they have pre-existing kidney disease or if they have some reason you cannot give them tons of fluids, um, that would be the case where you'd want to uh, use that. 
Um, again, usually treatment is going to be, um, and in this case, you can actually see some uh, more permanent damage being done here. So it's partially reversible in general, especially if you catch it early enough. Um, but again, sometimes these patients are getting kind of recurrent doses of it. So it may not be something you notice uh, right away. So kind of the damage has already been done in some cases. Um, sometimes they need re renal replacement therapy, things like dialysis potentially, um, and then replace the electrolytes as you need to since they are wasting so many of them. Yes? Um, usually uh, days, yeah, because yeah. it takes a little bit of time for the, because um, again, usually you see like these uh, chemotherapeutic agents affecting kind of the most rapidly dividing cells most quickly, because those are the ones they're catching in the in the uh, mito mitotic processes, but um, usually the kidneys are not going to be one of those as rapidly dividing ones. So it may take a few days for the injury to really occur. Okay. Um, up next is amphotericin. We oftentimes call this amphoterable B because it is uh, so bad on the kidneys. Um, this is why we uh, really reserve this one to really invasive um, fungal uh, infection. So if you have something like a fungal ball in the lungs or uh, more invasive uh, fungal disease in your, you know, say like immunosuppressed patients, this is where we'll use that because you end up seeing nephrotoxicity. If you use the original base products around 30 to 80 percent, so very wide ranging but uh, very frequent uh, occurrence here. This is another one you can see a lot of wasting of things like electrolytes and, and impaired um, impaired reabsorption of other products. Um, usually it's going to be dose related and it can occur days to weeks after the fact. So you may give the drug, may be done with it, and then still see the injury occur well after that. Again, this one is going to be related back to its mechanism of action. The way that it affects the fungal cells is that it prevents ergosterol uh, from producing uh, the cell wall for the fungus. But we do have some amount of ergosterol in our cell membranes, and so that same thing is being affected there and is causing the damage uh, basically by just lysing the cells. Um, also, it can cause some afferent arteriolar uh, vasoconstriction, so you can end up seeing some impaired blood flow due to that as well. So um, other risk factors we're going to see with this uh, pre-existing kidney injury, giving you large cumulative doses or um, actually short infusion times can worsen this as well. So normally we'll give this over several hours uh, of time. Um, volume depletion, because again, they're going to be having some polyuria, so you want to make sure they're, they're tanked up with fluids. And then other nephrotoxins will do this as well. So again, imagine a patient who's on, say, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, and then you had to add on amphotericin because you're worried about a fungal infection. All this is going to be very uh, much kind of um, playing off one another. You can see a really bad kidney injury there. Um, one of the best things that we can do, though, in order to help prevent um, uh, damage from this is actually using a different dosage form. Um, so there's uh, several liposomal formulations. Um, so you have a picture here. So this one's called ambosome, where basically you have this lipid bilayer, uh, very similar to what our cell membranes look like, and then the drug is actually implanted within that bilayer. And so um, basically uh, it helps to deliver the drug to the site of action and actually helps to limit the interaction with the renal cells. So it affects uh, the fungal cells more and hopefully spares our renal cells uh, for the most part. Um, the problem with it, so it's very, very expensive compared to the original product. Say, you know, $1,000 uh, therapy a day versus just $5. So infotericin B is very, very uh, cheap, but the uh, liposomal products are much more expensive. Um, other things we do is slow down the infusion time and also give them lots of fluids, hopefully help to make sure that the renal flow is as good as we can make it. Um, again, this is another one where uh, the kidney injury may not be totally reversible, so hopefully we can catch that earlier uh, if possible, and then just replace our electrolytes. And then um, with drugs that cause intratubular obstruction, um, again, this is basically related back to the precipitation of the drug crystals in those distal tubular lumens. Um, so you can either end up seeing uh, just the obstruction itself causing uh, uh, diminished urine flow. Um, it can also cause interstitial nephritis, or you can have this kind of superimposed acute tubular necrosis, right? Um, so you kind of have a, an evolving uh, condition where uh, basically the, the crystals themselves are doing damage to the cells over time. So it starts obstructive and they become more um, actual direct injury to the cells themselves. So um, again, the pathogenesis is just related back to the precipitation of, of the drug. Um, you can end up seeing this uh, due to uh, several different reasons. It may not be directly due to the drug itself precipitating, but due to uh, other kind of downstream effects of drugs that we give. Um, so we mentioned things like a tumor lysis syndrome that can occur after giving certain chemotherapeutic agents. You end up lysing a lot of those cells, they produce a lot of uric acid, and that can produce uric acid crystals in the, in the kidneys. Um, one of the ways we can prevent this is giving you know, lots of fluids and also using things like allopurinol. You, know, you remember how that drug works? as an antioxidase inhibitor, right? So it actually prevents the formation of uric acid. So we can give that as a preventative agent in some of the cases. That's also where we use that one drug, rasburicase, that actually helps to cleave the, the uric acid into more soluble form. So sometimes you'll see that. Uh, and then rhabdomyolysis is another one where you can see precipitation of myoglobin within the kidneys and cause uh, acute kidney failure there as well. So uh, say, for instance, you had HMG-CoA reductase inhibitor like... 
you know, simvastatin, something like that, and then you had a CYP3A4 inhibitor on board. That could be a case where you'd see rhabdo develop uh, and can cause kidney injury there. Um, now, for the drug itself uh, causing uh, precipitation, this is normally going to be related back to having low urine volumes uh, if the drug has low solubility or if you have volume depletion, right? So things get basically get dehydrated on the kidneys, the drug's more likely to precipitate. Um, so you can see this very frequently with acyclovir, methotrexate's another big one. Uh, and sometimes you can have foscarnet, which is an antiviral agent mixing with calcium, and it forms a precipitation there as well. So... Anyway, so uh, basically the biggest things to do for those patients are frequently to give uh, good hydration. Um, in some cases, you may be giving things like um, alkalinization with sodium bicarbonate to make sure that the uh, pH is kept up and make sure that uh, the patient has that precipitation, the risk of that being as low as possible. So um, any questions on that? If not, we will go to break. I'll come back in 10 minutes and we will start talking about sodium. Okay, uh, so any questions from the first half? Okay, so this uh, talk on, on salt homeostasis is, uh, I think it's important stuff to know, uh, especially when you're considering like you know, giving fluids to patients. Uh, it also can be a little difficult to describe. Uh, so if I say anything that doesn't make sense, uh, make sure please raise your hand to clarify because I have a lot of patients or a lot of people that will ask questions later and it'd be better to clear it up during, during class. So, um, okay, so we have an amount of total body water that is in every single patient, right? Um, and basically it can be divided up into a couple of different compartments. Uh, you can have the intracellular compartment, which is about 60% of the total body weight. Um, primarily the water is kept in the cells by things like electrolytes. So primarily see things like potassium, right? Because potassium intracellular concentration is usually a lot higher than extracellular. Because, you know, if you're looking at, say, like, what's a normal sodium concentration? Like 140 mil equivalents per liter. What's a normal uh, potassium? Like four, right? So say like maybe you know three and a half to five or something like that. Um, so a lot of that potassium is in the cells. It's not necessarily in the blood. So that's where we want it to be. Otherwise, your heart probably wouldn't be working too great. But anyway, um, that's usually where it was keeping the a lot of the water in, right? So in the extracellular component uh, is going to be 40% of the total body water. And this is mainly maintained by uh, your sodium, your chloride, and your bicarbonate. And so the, again, this is in, mainly like an intravascular space is where you're going to see a lot of this uh, extracellular water being at. It's also in, in between cells and things like that. But when we say extracellular water compartment, I'm mainly talking about like the intravascular space. Okay. Um, and so we maintain this balance by using that sodium potassium ATPase pump, right? Because this is uh, pumping things along with or against the concentration gradient against, right? Because it's an active process. It uses ATP to do this. So again, it's pumping sodium against the concentration out of the cells um, and pumping potassium into the cells, right? That's how we maintain our balance there. And so uh, essentially what you end up having is an equal osmolality between uh, the intracellular and the extracellular uh, compartments, okay? Water is able to permeate freely, uh, but it basically is able to maintain a normal balance. That way you don't have dehydration of the cells. You don't have uh, too much swelling of the cells. The osmolar osmolarity between the two, it should be kept equal, okay? And when you shift either one of those, you're going to see water shift in one direction or the other. And we'll talk about how that happens in a second. So um, again, when you give things like isotonic fluids, which should be very close to the osmolarity of the blood, things like normal uh, saline or 0.9% sodium chloride. Do you guys remember um, how many mil equivalents of sodium is in 0.9% sodium chloride? 154. 154 mil equivalents. And then uh, there's 154 mil equivalents per liter of sodium. And then 154 of chloride equals out, you know, 308, uh, pretty close to, to um, normal human serum osmolarity. That's why it's going to be isotonic. Okay. So you see really no net shift of uh, intracellular or extracellular fluid. So if I give you, uh, say, a liter of fluid of uh, normal saline into the intravascular space, the majority of that fluid stays right there. You're not going to see it necessarily shift outward or inward. Uh, it's going to usually just stay right there. Now, on the other hand, if I were to give you hypertonic solutions, say anything greater than 0.9% sodium chloride, so if I were to give you, say, 3% sodium chloride, um, you'd end up seeing uh, water flow from the extracellular, I'm um, sorry, the intracellular component and is going to increase uh, the amount of fluid in the extracellular compartment, right? So that's, uh, again, very similar to why we use hypertonic saline when patients have cerebral edema. We can give it into the, uh, hypertonic saline into the intravascular space. That's going to draw fluid off of uh, the CNS, which would be considered part of the intracellular uh, fluid compartment and draw it into the extracellular space. Does that make sense? Okay. And then vice versa, if I give a hypotonic uh, solution, so say I gave 0.45% sodium chloride or half normal saline, that's going to cause more fluid to travel into the intracellular compartment. 
Okay, and so that way, if you had a patient who's really kind of fluid depleted, uh, very frequently you end up giving half normal saline because uh, that'll actually help to kind of uh, beef up the the, uh, the intracellular uh, compartment and kind of help to rehydrate it. So, um, looking at uh, different solutions that you may give uh, patients in the intravenous route and seeing where that fluid is going to go to, um, and also about the kind of the free water we'll talk about. And so, um, basically, if you're looking at something like uh, say normal saline, let me get my laser pointer. <laughs> You have something like normal saline or 0.9% sodium chloride. Notice it doesn't have any dextrose concentration. Uh, it makes pretty, uh, pretty good sense there. And you can see here you can have your, your sodium or chloride concentrations in milliequivalents per liter. And notice this is going to be isotonic, uh, very similar to what we see with uh, lactated ringers. Okay, So again, lactated ringers is another kind of uh, alternative to normal saline because it is also isotonic, usually a little bit more balanced as far as electrolytes go with things like magnesium, potassium, and whatnot. Um, but basically, if you're looking at where the fluid is going to end up, um, most majority of it is going to end up in the extracellular uh, space because again that's where we're putting it into the into the vasculature that's where it's going to stay at so if I had a patient who say who came in septic and they had a depleted intravascular space they were hypotensive because they had, didn't have enough fluid in, in the vessels I would give them normal saline because that's going to help to uh, beef that back up and, and replete the intravascular space okay that makes sense so far so we say basically there's zero free water because the water is not necessarily going to be traveling into the intracellular fluid compartment Okay, all the water is going to stay right there within the, the a, uh, extracellular fluid compartment. Okay, on the other hand, if I were to give something like half normal saline, you're going to see that this is uh, basically half the concentration of sodium chloride in here. So it's going to be hypotonic in comparison to normal human serum. And then you're going to see that uh, some part, portion of this is going to stay within the extracellular fluid, uh, but some part of it is going to go to the intracellular space. And you can see how the split happens here. About 75% is going to be uh, staying in the vasculature. About 37% goes into the cells. Okay, so we consider this to be about 500 ml if you were to give a liter of free water. Okay, that means that much free water is going to be traveling into the intracellular uh, fluid space. Okay, if you were to give something like D5, um, you're going to see a lot higher amount of this because again it's hypotonic uh, comparison to, to the serum. A lot higher amount is going to end up uh, in the inter intracellular fluid space and it's a lot more free water. So this is why very frequently we don't like to give uh, just plain D5 to like pediatric patients because they're not able to really maintain um, that fluid balance very well. They get hyponatremic. It's, it's not really good for them uh, from that standpoint. So that's why we normally don't give just D5 by itself in a lot of cases. But on the other hand, you would end up seeing 3% normal uh, sodium chloride. Again, this is going to be hypertonic. You're going to see that all of the fluid here that you give is going to stay in the extracellular space. It actually has negative free water because it's going to draw fluid from the intracellular space out of the cells and into the intravascular space. Okay. So again, you can see by concentration of sodium that you're giving, you can change the, the flow of fluids uh, pretty significantly. And this is why we like to give things like 3% saline to draw fluid um, off of, say, like the brain and if you have a head trauma and you have cerebral edema. Everyone with me so far? All right. So uh, serum sodium should be very tightly regulated for the most part, and this helps to determine that plasma osmolality. I'll probably end up mixing osmolality and osmolarity together, so chemistry nerds out there, forgive me, please. Um, but uh, it also helps to regulate a lot of the blood volume as well. Um, kidney helps to regulate the actual excretion of water, and this is going to be a lot through that kind of hypothalamic uh, feedback there. Now, normal serum osmolarity uh, should be you know, around 300, you can say maybe 275 to 295 milliosms per kilogram. Um, and you also see the osmolality is going to be affected by your glucose and also your BUN. So again, this is why you can see big shifts in uh, fluids as well. If you had like a patient who had, say, long-standing DKA, so they have really high glucose concentration for a while, that can actually end up drawing uh, fluids uh, off the brain as well and cause some problems there. So uh, that is kind of a more specific thing with DKA we um, may talk about later. But um, another way that we help to regulate uh, the intravascular volume of fluid and also regulate uh, sodium uh, concentration is going to be with arginine vasopressin, uh, or AVP might be called, and sometimes you'll actually see it being known as antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Okay. Uh, again, this is released from the pituitary, and this is usually in response to increased osmolality. Um, so what, what is the case you might have increased osmolality? So you're losing fluid, you have a higher sodium concentration. So if you had dehydration, that's usually going to be a big impetus for having uh, more antidiuretic hormone being released, right? Because again, it's antidiuretic hormone, so it stops you from diuresing, right? So you're going to be holding on to more fluid. So usually if you're fluid dehydrated, this is why you have uh, more antidiuretic hormone being released. 
Basically, it binds to vasopressin receptors in the renal tubules, and this is going to actually insert these aquaporin channels into the tubular lumen, and that will help to reabsorb more water through the kidneys, uh, and also will stimulate water reab uh, reabsorption through that route, and then also thirst as well. So the patients are going to uh, think that they need, want to drink more. Um, you'll also see, because usually when you're fluid depleted, your blood pressure does what? It should go down, right? Because you need need pressure within the vessels to cause the blood pressure, right? Um, so blood pressure is going to go down, and that way you'll actually stimulate your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system as well, and get that regulated. So again, that's going to cause vasoconstriction and increase that blood pressure as well. Okay. Again, and when you're drinking alcohol, like I'm sure none of you did last week, uh, what does that do to antidiuretic hormone? Suppresses. Suppresses it, which is why you don't want to break the seal, because then there's a lot of diuresis, which is also why you get very dehydrated and why you have a headache the next day. A lot of people don't play the water games. So that's a problem. But anywho, um, so we're going to talk about vasopressin uh, a lot when we're talking about regulation of serum sodium and, and uh, intravascular volume. Um, but first, we'll talk about hyponatremia, uh, some of the causes for that, and how we're going to treat that specifically. Um, you can see that hyponatremia may, may be related back to either normal, increased, or decreased plasma osmolality. And so there's several different causes for each of those uh, that you're going to see. So, for instance, you know, usually when you're assessing these patients, one of the first things you want to do is assess the osmolality to figure out, you know, is it, you know, is it high, low, or normal for that for that patient. So, for instance. So you start out with a serum osmolality, say, okay, I have a hyponatremic patient uh, and it's, you know, I have a normal, uh, hypo, I'm sorry, a normal uh, serum osmolality here. So you can have a pseudo hyponatremia, which could have some specific causes for that. I'm probably not going to talk about that one too much. Um, so once you have an elevated serum osmolality, this may be related back to hyperglycemia. So you can actually end up seeing that you have a lot of dextrose within, or a lot of glucose within the bloodstream that can actually draw water into it uh, and actually dilute out your, your serum sodium. So that can be, sometimes you'll see that with um, a DKA patient, sometimes your, um, your HHN patients, you know, for type 2 diabetics. And then the one we'll probably spend the most time with is going to be low osmolarity. And then we'll talk about things like hypo, hyper, and euvolemic hyponatremia. So we're going to go more into details on these in just a little bit. And, on some of the causes and how we can treat that. So um, if we have a hypertonic hyponatremia, again, um, usually this is going to be because we have kind of excessive uh, you know, osmols that are floating around the bloodstream that's working to um, dilute out the, uh, the sodium that we have there. So again, most commonly you're going to see this with hyperglycemia. And so glucose can provide this kind of high osmol osmolality shifting uh, fluid from the intracellular space to the extracellular space, and again, that dilutes out the serum sodium you already had there. So they may have a total body normal amount of serum sodium, but it gets diluted by uh, the fluid that the dextrose is uh, kind of shifting into the um, into the extracellular space. And so essentially what you end up seeing here, and kind of a handy uh, rule of thumb for some of your uh, diabetic patients, is that for every 100 milligram per deciliter increase in glucose, you can actually see your serum sodium go down about 1.7 milliequivalents per liter. So for some of your patients who say come in with uh, DKA or HHS and you are, um, you know, they're, they're hyponatremic, you can actually look at their glucose and kind of uh, assess what their actual serum sodium should be um, based on this kind of calculation and say, okay, well, they may not need a whole lot of replacement of sodium. They probably have a total normal amount of sodium. We just may need to get off the, the dextrose there. You can see this with other things like mannitol. Other osmotic agents can do this as well. Um, sometimes we will see this with... Um, Osmotic agents like uh, if we have toxic alcohols like ethylene glycol or methanol from a tox standpoint, sometimes you can see that. So if a kid drinks radiator fluid or someone drink windshield washer fluid, like you can sometimes see um, a dilutional hyponatremia from that standpoint. And if you measure the serum osmolarity, it would be very high because alcohols tend to add uh, to the osmolar uh, count. So uh, if you had a hypotonic hyponatremia, this is going to be the most common thing that we're going to run into, um, and it's going to have the most different number of causes that can, can lead to this. And so for these patients, the first thing you need to do is determine what their fluid volume status is. Uh, so whether they're hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic, you'll see there's different causes that are going to be related back to that. So uh, if you have a hypovolemic, hypotonic hyponatremia, everyone with me? It's a lot of hypos, right? Um, so if you're hypo hypo, um, then you will have generally it's going to be related back to uh, excessive fluid loss. So things like diarrhea, vomiting, diuretics. So if you had like someone who's abusing diuretics, you can see this. Um, this is going to cause stimulation of arginine vasopressin or that antidiuretic hormone, and so this will again stimulate water reabsorption. It's going to stimulate thirst, and so you end up having patients who end up taking in a lot of uh, just plain water, right? So this is again why, in, like especially in pediatrics, you tell them to drink Pedialyte. You know, you don't tell them to drink Gatorade because again, Gatorade doesn't really have a ton of electrolytes in it to begin with. Um, so again. Free water uh, is going to help dilute out any sodium they may have in the bloodstream to begin with. 
So uh, some of the things you're going to see with this is that generally the urine osmolar osmolality is going to be high because arginine vasopressin is going to be concentrating the urine as much as it can. Um, and then you can sometimes see this with uh, more commonly with thiazide diuretics. Um, a lot of times the patients are going to be kind of uh, asymptomatic, uh, maybe you know just a, a mild drop in their uh, serum sodium, but for the most part um, they're not really going to have a lot of problems with that. It's more like you know high dose like loop, di uh, loop diuretic abuse, um, a lot of diarrhea, vomiting can lead to, to this one more commonly. So uh, for euvolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, so the patient has a normal fluid volume status. Um, basically, they have a normal amount of extracellular fluid uh, sodium, um, but we have increases in, in total body water in the extracellular fluid volume, right? Basically, um, the patients don't really have uh, a volume overload. They kind of uh, have uh, come to a set point where they've kind of maintained, um, you know, they don't really have pulmonary edema or uh, ascites or anything like that. They have kind of a normal fluid volume status, it looks like to them. Um, and this is the uh, most common cause is SIADH. You guys know what that stands for? Syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone uh, release, right? So SIDH, so the most common cause you can see it with certain cancers, like uh, small cell lung cancer, pancreatic cancers, um, some CNS disorders. So like when I uh, rotated in the surgical ICU, we have a lot of head trauma patients who end up having SIADH um, related back to uh, head traumas uh, that were happening. So again, they you know kind of get over the initial um, uh, problems, you know, injuries and surgeries they had. And then this is oftentimes kind of the thing that kept them in the ICU was this kind of prolonged SIADH. Um, You'll never have a patient who is trying to uh, sneak water so bad as, as some of these patients. So uh, we had patients who would end up uh, uh, sneaking out of their room to the cafeteria to get Gatorade because they were just so thirsty from all this ADH. I mean, it was it was very difficult to help um, you know limit their their water in, intake in these cases. So we'll talk about treatment in a little bit, uh, but again, too much ADH, you're going to have a lot of thirst, a lot of water reabsorption. Other things you can see this with are going to be um, you know, some pulmonary disease, so things like pneumonias, TB can do this. Um, and then also you can have primary or psychogenic polydipsia. So you have a lot, a lot of primary water intake uh, can end up leading to this. Um, sometimes you can have certain drug-induced causes um, as well that can lead to SIDH. So uh, most common reasons uh, for SIDH from drug-related purposes, if you have increased release of it, um, you can see this with things like uh, vinca alkaloids, opioids, haloperidol, which again, haloperidol is what type of drug? That's psychotic, right? Uh, nicotine can do this or tricyclic antidepressants. Um, some drugs may actually increase the sensitivity to antidiuretic hormones. So things like acetaminophen, carbamazepine, um, NSAIDs, lamotrigine, which lamotrigine, what is that type of drug? Hmm? There's anti-epileptic, well, sometimes used for bipolar disorder as well. That's lamictal, uh, if you ever see that one. And then some of them will have a uh, mixed action. So you have methylene dioxymethamphetamine or MDMA or ecstasy, as some of you may know it. <coughs> Um, ACE inhibitors, SSRIs can also do this as well. They're kind of doing a little bit of both, increasing uh, activity of, of uh, ADH by increasing release and also um, making that, uh, the receptors more sensitive to it. And then if you have a hypervolemic hypotonic hyponatremia, this is basically um, the ability for the kidney to uh, excrete sodium and water is going to be impaired. And so you end up having this kind of expanded extracellular fluid volume and you end up seeing edema in these cases. Um, but you basically have a decreased effective arterial blood volume. Um, most usually as you can see causes of sodium re retention and further volume expansion edema. So it's kind of just kind of self-perpetuating itself. Um, this is most likely due back to things like cirrhosis, CHF, or nephrotic syndrome. So we're most likely to see this, right? So the patients are going to appear to be edematous uh, because basically they're just having too much fluid on board um, related back to this. And that's diluting out the sodium as well. So, um, Again, one of the big things you're going to note with uh, hyponatremia is you want to consider how long standing it's been. Um, so the body is able to kind of re-equilibrate a lot of things in relation to serum sodium if given time. So if you have kind of chronic, say greater than 48 hours, mild hyponatremia, so say somewhere between like say 125 to 134, generally the patients are going to be asymptomatic. Okay, they're not really going to have any problems with this. Um, if you do have symptoms, it's primarily going to be neurologic. Uh, and so, you know, say, you know, mild cases, you can see maybe some nausea, some malaise, if you have more moderate um, hyponatremia, say like 115 to 124, so we're going to start to see things like he uh, headache, lethargy, disorientation, and then when you get very severe, say 110 to 114, this is where seizures can be a big thing, and then uh, brainstem herniation uh, can be another big problem with that. Why, why do you think you see brainstem herniation with um, hyponatremia like this, this severe? 
So keep in mind that the the CNS like it takes time to reequilibrate things like glucose and, and takes time to reequilibrate uh, things like sodium, right? Because the brain is, is a protected area; it doesn't like things to, to shift very frequently. Um, so say for instance you have a, a normal serum sodium concentration, say like 140 in the brain, uh, but then the serum sodium drops to say like 110 in the blood. Where's water going to go to? It's going to go to the brain, right? So it's going to want to uh, kind of dilute out the the increased serum. Uh, sodium in the brain, so it's going to go travel up there, and that's where you can see uh, brain stem herniation happen from that, right? Um, now that may not happen if it, you know, give it, uh, you know, say over several weeks that were to occur. Um, but again, uh, CNS manifestations are the biggest reason why we end up seeing these patients. So, um, you know, you see this a lot, especially in cases where, uh, you know, it's Florida summertime, it gets hot, people want to get in shape, they go to these boot camps, um, they end up uh, losing a lot of salt through the sweat, they end up losing a lot of fluid, and then they're intaking just a ton, ton of water. So we end up seeing a lot of hyponatremic seizures related back to that. Um, sometimes I've seen some ecstasy cases related back to this as well. So again, if they're coming to the ER, it changes out they're probably manifesting some of these neurologic symptoms most likely. So um, obviously, as far as laboratory tests, you're going to be monitoring their serum sodium. Anything less than 135 would be considered to be hyponatremic. Uh, but also looking at things like plasma osmolality and urine sodium can help with the diagnosis as well. I'm not going to get super into that, but um, uh, just be aware those are things you're going to be looking at. And, and keep in mind other things like serum, uh, glucose may be affecting your uh, sodium. You know, look at their lipids, their kidney function, thyroid function, all that can be playing a role here. And then um, the cerebral edema is a big thing we're worried about. Um, and this is going to be related to that speed and the degree of change in serum osmolality. So usually the brain takes about 48 hours to really compensate. And so if you have, uh, you know, this hyponatremia develop over the course of a week or so, you don't really see that, uh, that cerebral edema occur. But if it happens, you know, over the course of, say, several hours, that's where you're more likely to see that occur there. So um, the other problem is you don't want to correct serum sodium too quickly. Do you guys know what happens if you correct it too quickly? Pontine yeah, central pontine myelinolysis. There's a couple other names for that. But yeah, that's the big thing. So um, you don't want to correct it too quickly. Um, basically, what you end up seeing is that, say, for instance, you have a patient who's been living, say, at uh, a serum sodium of, say, 115. Right. So now the brain is set at 115, and then the serum is set at 115. If I rapidly increase the serum uh, sodium concentration, where does the water go at that point? out of the CNS, right, because it wants to go dilute out what's in the serum. Uh, and so by having that rapid shift there, that's where you can see demyel demyelination that can occur. And so uh, you have to be super, super careful with this. There's lots of um, calculations that are involved in how to actually uh, fix the serum sodium in these cases. Uh, and if you go too quickly, I mean, that's a very fast case for causing um, uh, severe morbidity and mortality in your patients. So we'll talk more about that in a second. You may also see it called osmotic demyelination syndrome. So if you see ODS, that's also what is uh, being referred to there. Um, but basically, you're having decrease, uh, an acute decrease in the brain, brain cell volume uh, as the water rushes out, and that's where that demyelination can occur. So you see this uh, quadriparesis, Parkinsonism, uh, you know, pseudobulbar palsy, locked-in syndrome, all these things that can occur, and usually around one to seven days after treatment. So it may not be initially uh, evident, um, but you'll certainly know when you, you know, correct the sodium too quickly and someone looks at it and goes, oh, crap. That's usually uh, uh, the first sign you'll run into. Not really. You shouldn't hear that. Um, but anyway, uh, as as the uh, as you correct it more slowly, uh, the brain's able to equilibrate a little bit better with that. You don't have as much shift of the the sodium and the fluids there. So uh, treatment, uh, obviously you have to treat the underlying cause. So if it was a specific drug that caused like an SIDH, you want to get rid of that. Um, you also need to balance out, you know, kind of what they're experiencing at the, the current moment um, and balancing that versus the ODS risk, right? Um, so if a patient comes in seizing, um, I need to fix that first, right? Because that's obviously going to be the more life-threatening thing than having this demyelination syndrome. So we'll talk about how to manage that. But um, in general, and we'll go into more detail, but if you're correcting hypovolemic hyponatremia, so someone is fluid uh, depleted, you want to give them just normal saline. It's usually going to be the best thing to help correct them. And again, if you think about it, normal saline has how many milliequivalents of sodium in it? 154 milliequivalents per liter. So that's probably going to be hypernatremic compared to what the patient is to begin with. So again, if their serum sodium is 130 milliequivalents per liter and I'm giving them 154 per liter, that's going to raise them up. Okay. So normal saline can be very good to, to replenish those patients who are hypovolemic to begin with. If they are euvolemic or hypervolemic um, with hyponatremia, usually you're going to see that we're going to manage it by um, restricting their water intake. Um, that we're going to use some of our things that can actually block the actions of AVP. Uh, so we'll go into more of those in, a de in, in detail in just a little bit. And then for more severe uh, 
causes or cases of hyponatremia, this is where we use concentrated sodium chloride. Um, so anytime you're using anything more concentrated than 0.9% sodium chloride, be very, very careful with it. It's very easy to kill someone with that. Um, we have a lot of safeguards in place in order to help prevent that in a lot of hospitals. So this is where you're dealing with, say, 3% sodium chloride or even higher than that. Some cases, 23.4% sodium chloride. Very, very concentrated stuff. So if you ever see like someone like handling a bag of 3% uh, saline like it's a grenade, like that's usually why it's because it's so easy to screw up and give someone too much of that and cause some problems there. But um, so if a patient comes in and they have an acute or severely symptomatic hypotonic hyponatremia, um, best thing to do is to manage it either with the 3% sodium chloride. And just to give you an idea of the comparison between the sodium concentrations, this one has 513 milliequivalents of sodium per liter just compared to 154. Okay, uh, so much, much more concentrated. And again, some places will even use 23.4% sodium chloride. So like the place I uh, worked at with a, a surgical ICU, um, they were very comfortable with using that 23.4% and um, very, very scared to use that stuff, but they, they were very uh, well versed with it. Um, most patients uh, require about a 5% increase in their sodium concentration to have, kind of fix some of those neurologic complications, but um, usually you can have targeting 120 little equivalents per liter. Um, and you want to compare the urinary uh, sodium to the corrective fluid as well. In some cases, if you have a hyponatremia related to SIDH, you can actually worsen it with sodium chloride. We'll talk more about that when we get into more specific treatments for that. And then in some cases, if you have a patient who can't really tolerate a lot of fluid, you'll give loop diuretics as well to help kind of diarrhea some of that off uh, to make sure they don't get more fluid uh, overloaded. So, um, Again, patients with uh, hypo, hypovolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremia can use uh, normal sodium, 0.9% uh, sodium chloride there, help correct the hyponatremia, hypovolemia. Um, but if they are, um, if you have some hypervolemic patients, again, you don't want to give them too much fluid because they're already uh, fluid overloaded to begin with. Sometimes you will use things like 3% uh, sodium chloride just because it's a smaller volume you have to give, and usually about a third or so uh, of what you would give the normal saline. Okay. Um, so the question is, if you have a patient, um, how can you determine how their uh, fluid volume is going, or their serum sodium is going to change based on the fluids that you give them? And there's a way to actually calculate this out. Um, I will not actually do calculate this specifically, but it's good to have an idea of the principles behind this. Um, so that way, if you ask a test question about some of the concepts, you can be uh, familiar with that. But essentially, um, if you wanted to determine how, based on how much fluid you're going to be giving, uh, how it's going to shift the sodium, you can do it with this calculation. So basically what you do is the delta in their sodium, or the change in their sodium uh, in the serum, is going to be their uh, sodium in the IV that you're giving uh, versus the sodium uh, in the uh, serum, so the NAS. You're going to uh, subtract those out, and you're going to divide that by their total body water plus the amount of volume they're giving in the IV. Okay, so if, for instance, I were to give a liter of normal saline, uh, basically the calculation would say be uh, 154 minus whatever the patient's serum sodium is divided by their total body water plus one liter. Okay, so typically the way you can figure out their total body water is that for guys it's going to be 0.6 liters per kilogram and then for ladies it's going to be 0.5 liters per kilogram. Do you guys know why the difference is there? Usually has to do with um, uh, body fat disposition. Is that usually ladies have a little bit more in general, so they get uh, they have less total body water as compared with uh, with guys. So uh, 0.6 liters per kilogram for men. Uh, basically, if you had a 100 kilogram guy, he would be how much total body water? He'd be 60 liters versus a 100 kilogram woman would be. Yeah, that's in general. It's not obviously not going to be um, perfect for every single patient, but that's in general what you're going to see there. Um, so if you have any like bodybuilding, you know, ladies, or if you have any like morbidly obese guys, like you know, it could be shifting a little bit there. Um, Again, in general, the goal is to achieve a serum sodium of 125 to 130 or so. There you should be able to eliminate most of the um, neurologic consequences of hyponatremia. Uh, and essentially, uh, you don't want to correct more than 12 milliequivalents per liter in the first 24 hours. It's a very important number to remember not to correct more than that, because uh, that will increase your risk for having that uh, demyelination syndrome. Okay. Um, obviously, if your patient is seizing, you need to give them enough sodium to help uh, fix that initially. But after that point, you know, say you were to give them, uh, you know, three percent saline to fix the seizing, you raise them up by nine milliequivalents per liter. You just go ahead and do the rest of the three milliequivalents, you know, throughout the rest of the day. Okay. But twelve milliequivalents per liter in the first twenty-four hours is a good rule of thumb. So, for instance, let's say we had a 66-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department for vertigo and disorientation. Uh, she started carbamazepine 10 days ago. And you guys remember carbamazepine can cause? It's IADH, so it can cause hyponatremia from that, right? So carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine are very uh, well known for causing that. So always think about that. I mean, look at their med list. Um, she comes in, her serum sodium is found to be 108 milliequivalents per liter. 
So you say, oh crap, let me go ahead and fix that. Um, so one, step one, what should you do? Stop defending agents. Stop defending agents. So we're going to get rid of the carbamazepine. And then next we got to determine, well, how do we want to fix her, her serum sodium? How do we want to uh, correct this? So again, what would be desired in this case is we want to raise her by about 12 milliequivalents per liter in the first 24 hours. So say 108 plus 12, it's going to be 120. So that's what our goal is going to be, is to get her to 120 milliequivalents per liter. So then we have to determine, well, how much 3% sodium, if I was going to use that, how much uh, would I have to infuse in order to figure, uh, you know, in order to get that, uh, you know, that 12 milliequivalent per liter difference. And so essentially what I can do is put in uh, the equation here. So if I were to give her, say, um, if I were to give her, I'm trying to see here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so for this patient, so I'm going to do uh, 513 milliequivalents per liter because that's how many how much sodium is in that 3% uh, sodium chloride, right? Uh, and then I'm going to subtract out her serum sodium. So I'm going to do 513 minus that 108, okay? Then I'm going to figure out what her total body water is. So I'm going to do 0.5 times that 60 kilograms. And then let's say I were to give a liter of 3% saline. I'm going to see how much difference that's going to give me there. So I'll do that. And so I get basically 405 milliequivalents per liter divided by 31 liters. Okay, based on that. And then uh, basically, if I were to give one liter of 3% sodium chloride, I'm basically going to get a change of about 13.06 milliequivalents per liter uh, if I were to give that whole liter at one time. Okay, so essentially what I can do then is I can say, well, I only want to give by 12. You know, I want to change it by 12. So I'm going to divide uh, 12 by that 13.06. And basically, I need to give 919 mLs of 3% saline. Okay, so what I'm going to do is divide that out and give it over a 24 hour period uh, in order to. Uh, make sure that we correct it over that, that time frame, right? You don't want to just like rush that whole liter in at one time because that would cause problems. Uh, you want to do it over a 24-hour period, okay? That makes sense for everyone so far? Okay, so let's say we want to do it with uh, normal saline instead. So we want to use 0.9% uh, and we'll see how much volume we have to give uh, in difference uh, or in comparison to that. So let's say, for instance, we use the 154 minus the 108 um, and get, get in the same body water um, calculation there. So you get 46 divided by 31, and so basically, if I were to give one liter of sodium chloride, I'm going to give, uh, I'm going to change the serum sodium by 1.48, or about one and a half milliequivalents per liter. So then, if I wanted to figure out how many liters I would have to give her over a 24 hour, hour period, it ends up to be about 8.1 8 liters. Okay, so then you can figure out your fluid rate by dividing that through uh, by 24. That makes sense so far. So why would I choose one or the other? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she comes in, she's hypovolemic, then she may need more hydration, right? But usually that's IDH, you're going to be usually um, euvolemic for the most part. So this might be a case where I don't want to, you know, if she had uh, concomitant CHF or if she had renal dysfunction, I did not want to give her a ton of fluids, that might lead me to use more than 3%, right? Uh, so keep those kind of things in mind where how much volume can the patient tolerate? Um, and, the, and the equation is going to be the same regardless of what the etiology of the hyponatremia is, whether they're fluid overloaded or not. Um, it's going to be the same regardless. But just keep that in mind um, that you need to do these calculations to figure out how much change you're going to get by giving a, a given volume of fluid, uh, and then you can figure out the rest from, from there. Everyone with me? Probably not, but when you go and review this later and I get questions about it, I'll say, like, you told me you were you had it. I have a video evidence of it right now. Okay. So she's on um, Tegretol for her season, and you're, she's just started on this. She's going to have to be put on something else so she doesn't start seizing in addition to this that may or may not be an effect of the SI-88, right? Let's say it was a bipolar patient. <laughs> but, okay, so let's say it was a seizure patient. Then what's your question? My question is, what do you, you switch her to something that doesn't cause SI-88? Mm -hmm. Do you put her on dilantin? You put her on phenytoin. You could do uh, levetiracetam or Keppra. Lots of different options. You, can, you know, you could just have PRN um, benzodiazepines for seizure. You know, that could be another option. So especially because this will be uh, someone who's coming in patient, right, um, to, to correct her, her serum sodium. And so that'd be a patient where you'd want to, um, you'd probably put on, say, lorazepam, two milligrams PRN seizure uh, activity. You know, so that might be a decent thing to do until you can kind of figure out what else to go on. Because then at that point, like if a nephrologist involved, you need to get the neurologist involved, you know, if, if it was a real seizure patient to figure all that out. Okay. Yep. And so again, for someone who, uh, keep in mind that if this had occurred over, say, the course of several weeks, she's had time to really re-equilibrate. So she is more at risk for that ODS or that central pontine demyelination um, if you correct it too quickly. Um, for instance, I ran into a case when I was on rotations where I had that, um, that, you know, that older lady who was going to a boot camp, had not had any kind of physical activity before that, and it was like, you know, July in Florida. And so she ends up getting um, very dehydrated, um, ends up taking a, a ton of fluid uh, and dilutes herself out from uh, the 
uh, her sodium. And so essentially she comes in with a serum sodium say like 112 or something like that. Um, but that had happened over the course of say like four or five hours. So there was a medical error that happened. She actually ended up getting corrected um, within say like four hours, right? So they actually correct her back to like 135 or something. So correct her way too quickly, way too much. But the fact is her CNS had not had time to really adapt to that decrease in, in the serum sodium. So she didn't really have that problem that developed. She was at risk for it, but it was not, um, you know, had she had that occur over the course of several weeks, she would have been much more likely to have had um, some negative consequences from that. So think about the hyponatremia, how long it's kind of been uh, been developing for. Uh, if they have, if it's occurred very quickly, then they are more, they're more able to be to re, uh, replenished and not cause any problems. That makes sense. Okay. Um, so if you have a, uh, a non-emergent hypovolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremic patient, again, sodium chloride, 0.9% uh, is going to be the best thing to use for them. Um, this helps to prevent the risk of overcorrecting too quickly, right? Because we saw in the previous example, um, you could either use about a liter of 3% or like eight liters of, of sodium chloride, uh, normal saline, um, it's a lot easier to kind of, because again, once you give it, you can't really take it back in a lot of cases. So um, if you can always use normal saline, it's going to be uh, much safer for the most part. And for these patients who are hypovolemic, this helps to replace both the volume and the sodium. So it's a both good things for your patient. Uh, for the euvolemic one, so again, for management of SIDH, there's actually going to be some more drugs that are going to be involved uh, with this specifically. Um, but here, uh, the big thing we're going to do is help to restrict water and hopefully correct their underlying um, cause here. So again, uh, discontinue any offending agents like carbamazepine, tegretol, things like that. Uh, and then usually they're restricting their water intake to 1 to 1.2 liters per day. Uh, keep in mind, they're going to have that thirst instinct anyway, and so they're going to try to sneak water wherever they can. Um, in some cases, you can help to replenish uh, sodium chloride by giving um, salt tablets. So you actually give that along with the loop uh, or a loop diuretic uh, in order to help get rid of extra volume while still keeping the sodium in, in place, right? Because loop diuretics work by how do they work to cause diuresis? It, yeah, they block sodium reabsorption in the ascending loop of Henle. So if you block that, you're going to be losing sodium in the urine anyway. So that's why you want to give that salt repletion uh, with uh, the salt tablets. So um, some drugs that we can actually use to help uh, treat SIDH, so we have things like demeclocycline. This is actually a, a derivative of tetracycline, so it technically has some antibiotic activity there, but it actually works to inhibit tubular AVP activity, so it blocks the, the actual receptors from um, being activated by AVP. And so basically you're inducing kind of a mild diabetes insipidus. You guys know what that is? What is that? Yeah, basically you're just losing a ton and ton of water. We'll talk more about that when we get to uh, the hypernatremia a little bit later. But basically we're inducing a mild diabetes insipidus in order to help get rid of the extra fluid while we're still maintaining uh, as much salt as we can. Um, this takes some days to work. So we use this very frequently, especially in the surgical ICU when we had cases of SIDH. And so um, you don't want to use this for patients with uh, liver disease and then or compromised fluid intake. Uh, one of the problems you run into with uh, demeclocyclines, you actually see um, some renal tubular toxicity and acute kidney injury. So be aware of that. And then obviously we, uh, this has the same contraindications as tetracycline, so not to be used in patients less than eight or pregnant patients because uh, again, you worry about what? A teeth staining, bone staining, things like that. Um, some other things we can use, they actually have a direct vaso, uh, vasopressin receptor 2 antagonist, or called the V2 antagonist, um, kind of short and called them the VAPTANs. Um, basically, this is working to just block AVP, uh, essentially. And so you're decreasing water reabsorption in the kidneys, so we call them uh, aquaretics, essentially. So you're just losing primarily water, not necessarily salt, uh, along with that. Um, so a couple of ones we have here include conovaptan, uh, or, and then we have tolvaptan as well. Um, conovaptan is mainly going to be used in the hospital since it's IV only, uh, but tolvaptan can actually be used uh, as an oral product and can be used uh, more chronically. Um, be, just be aware that it is metabolized by CYP34, so you could have some interactions there if you had any inhibitors on board. Um, and then you don't want to use it in patients who are aneuric, um, because obviously uh, at that point this is going to be worsening it because you're getting less, even less water being uh, excreted out there. Um, and again, these are not appropriate for rapid uh, correction of serum sodium. Uh, for that, you need you know, things like hypertonic saline and things like that in order to help fix that. Um, but these are good for more kind of chronic, more uh, if you have days to weeks in order to help manage this, this is going to be better drugs for that. So um, for hypervolemic, hypotonic, hyponatremia, uh, basically you need to induce a negative water balance for these patients um, while minimizing changes for the intracellular volume. So basically you want to get rid of the extra fluid that's diluting out the, the serum sodium here. Uh, so obviously you can uh, fix the underlying cause. So again, if it's something like hyperglycemia, you know, things like insulin will help to, to fix that. Um, but we can also do things like limiting their fluid intake and also sodium intake as well, and that'll help to correct it. 
Um, if it's a case of, let's say, someone like CHF, where they have um, other issues uh, of fluid overload, um, you can use things like improving contract car uh, cardiac contractility to help get rid of the extra volume. So things like digoxin and maybe ACE inhibitors could also help with this. So you can just tune them up with their CHF and make sure they're on everything they're supposed to be uh, from that standpoint. Okay, so any questions on hyponatremia? Which is kind of the big thing, ways to treat that. So, you know, if they're hypovolemic, what's the best way to correct their serum sodium? What fluid? Normal saline. saline, that's good. Uh, again, if they're volume overloaded, again, it, for non-emergent cases, if we can handle it with water and uh, water and or salt restriction, that's usually going to be the best way to do it. Um, but again, uh, correcting an underlying cause is always going to be the best thing to do. Uh, for those emergent cases, if they're having kind of acute neurologic symptoms, uh, if they're having seizures, things like that, like those are the ones that are going to need things like 3% saline and we're going to help correct that very rapidly. So just kind of keep that in mind. Okay, um, so then hypernatremia, uh, this again can occur either from renal or extra renal fluid losses uh, that can occur, or if uh, patients are receiving hypertonic fluids. Uh, so again, if you've got too much hypertonic saline, obviously that can cause hypernatremia. Um, or if you have excess sodium ingestion, um, so they're getting too much sodium in their diet, this can be one source for it. Um, and here you can either have hypouvolemic or hypervolemic patients. Um, you're going to see that the causes can be a little different uh, depending on which uh, volume status the patient is. Uh, so for hypovolemic patients, usually it's either due to extra renal losses, um, you see this with diuretic use. Um, so basically they're losing more fluid, but they're holding on to too much sodium. Um, Post-op diuresis is another cause for this. It could be euvolemic. And so this would be a case where we have diabetes insipidus, which we'll talk more about later. And then a primary polydipsia. So again, they're ingesting too much um, too much fluid there. And then uh, the hypervolemic, so if you have a sodium overload, um, this can be related back to things like sodium bicarbonate, salt tablets, um, if you have like too concentrated tube feedings for some of those patients, um, or sodium containing medications that can all be potential causes for uh, this hypernatremia. So, um, again, water loss uh, is typically going to be occurring kind of through insensible losses. What are some examples of insensible losses? breathing, sweating, things like that. Those are kind of insensible losses that you can't really, you know, it's not really coming from the urine necessarily. But um, in a lot of cases, you'll find the hospitalized patients, they don't necessarily, you know, it's hard to, to count for, you know, because when you're monitoring fluid intake and output in your patients, you're, you're doing their ins and outs, right? Um, it's really hard to monitor for things like, you know, respiratory fluid loss or sweating and things like that. So uh, because that's not really taken into account, a lot of those patients don't get repleted with enough volume. And so that can be a big cause for, say, like inpatient causes of hypernatremia. They're really just um, dehydrated. Hydrated. Um, if you were to have a diabetes insipidus, some reasons for this, uh, you can end up seeing uh, centrally, there may be a, a cause for decreased AVP uh, secretion. Um, you can have nephrogenic causes as well, where the, maybe the, the patient has a decreased response to AVP. Right, so it's not able to really respond to whatever the brain's kicking out. Um, and basically when you have this diabetes insipidus, they're just having a large volume excretion of dilute urine. Really just not able to really concentrate it very well. So um, some causes for diabetes insipidus, um, you can see centrally, things like neurosurgery, head trauma, CNS malignancy, again, saw this very frequently in the, in the surgical ICU. Um, even ethanol ingestion will cause this acutely, right? Um, and then uh, nephrogenic wise, there's lots of drugs that can cause this as well. So things like uh, lithium is gonna be a big one, um, amphotericin B, demeclocycline, as we mentioned previously, and the Vaptans, because again, they're, they're antagonizing the effects of AVP in those cases. So um, again, with their clinical presentation, they're having a lot of uh, shift of uh, fluid from the intracellular to the extracellular space. You're going to see some polyuria associated with this as well. And so usually um, the symptoms of this can be related back to that neuronal cell volume being depleted. So you see things like weakness, lethargy. Um, sometimes you can actually have seizures develop from this, coma, death. Usually this is going to be... Uh, you know, if in general, you can see patients be more tolerant of hypernatremia than hyponatremia. So you usually have to get up to something like, you know, 160 or higher for it to really be a problem for some of these patients. And then, um, again, acute onset is usually going to be more uh, symptomatic than your chronic patients. So, again, if it's kind of a, a long-standing kind of thing developing over time, they usually tolerate that a little bit better than if it happens, you know, acutely. So uh, our goals here, we typically want to get our serum sodium back to 145 milliequivalents uh, per liter. And again, if we had rapid correction, uh, as opposed to hyponatremia, if we correct it too quickly, you saw fluid coming out of the brain. Um, here, if we correct it too quickly, you're going to have more fluid going into the brain, causing cerebral edema, seizures, and death. So not good things for our patients. We want to prevent that. Um, and then uh, you need to prevent the recurrence of it. So you may either need to look at sodium restriction or fluid replacement, uh, whatever it happens to be, or you know, if it's a particular drug or something like that, obviously keep the offending agent off, off the patient. 
So um, looking at uh, pharmacologic therapy for this, if they have a hypovolemic hypernatremia, um, you can, again, use normal saline. Does that make sense we can use normal saline? does because again when you're giving um you know, say their their serum sodium is at 160 uh if we're giving 154 mil equivalents per liter uh normal saline that's still less than where, where they're at and so it can actually help draw their, their fluid down um you know so you can maybe again uh give them normal saline until they get their volume status filled back up so they're intravascularly repleted and then you can actually use half normal saline or d5w in order to make sure you're drawing them down even further okay so start with normal saline and go to something less concentrated and so, again, here, another good rule of thumb is not to correct them any faster than 10 to 12 mil equivalents per liter per day. Um, again, uh, you know, if it occurred very quickly, so say it was a very acute cause for hypernatremia, you can probably correct a little bit quickly, more quickly than that, say maybe one mil equivalent per liter per hour. But uh, that 10 to 12 mil equivalents per liter per day is usually a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, as far as pharmacologic therapy for uh, central diabetes insipidus, you can use AVP replacement. So we can actually have uh, synthetic forms of uh, AVP. Uh, it's called desmopressin or DDAVP. Um, this one is uh, pretty poor as far as oral bioavailability goes. So we actually have nasal formulations uh, that you'll absorb uh, through the nasal mucosa. Um, this one we're usually... Um, titrating in order to help uh, regulate their urine output because again with diabetes insipidus they're going to have very high volumes of urine output so you can actually titrate this one to make sure they're having um, you know uh, not too much uh, urinary output make sure they're not having any kind of uh, you know nocturnal enuresis anything like that um, and then uh, basically have um, uh, urine volumes around one and a half to two liters per day and then keep their serum sodium around 137 to 142 it's usually kind of a good range um, for them so uh, desmopressin, uh, when given, has uh, some risk of water intoxication because, again, if you're giving exogenous AVP, it's going to stimulate your thirst and whatnot. Uh, and so you can actually see some excess uh, water retention. So you need to monitor uh, for the patient kind of overcorrecting and getting hyponatremia or hypovolemia. Um, obviously, if they're having more of a nephrogenic cause or diabetes insipidus, you want to discontinue the causative agent and then correct any kind of fluids you need to, like uh, the hypercalcemia or hypokalemia, you can fix those. Um, and then for those patients, usually they're going to have a mild um, ECF deficit, usually about a liter to one and a half liters. Um, so you can uh, correct that by uh, or inducing that by giving a thiazide diuretic and then restricting their, their salt intake. Um, that usually helps to cut the water volume uh, output by about 50% or so. Uh, so that can be very useful for, for those patients. Okay. And then uh, another drug we can potentially use is endomethacin. Uh, do you guys know what type of drug that is? It's an NSAID, yeah. So uh, an NSAID actually can help to potentiate the AVP activity. So that could be one drug you can use potentially um, to help kind of make the AVP that the brain's already uh, kicking out to be a little bit more effective. Okay, um, and then if they're having a sodium overload here, obviously you limit the sodium intake wherever it happens to be from, and then giving loop diuretics to help kind of um, get rid of that excess. Um, here you can use something like D5W uh, because again it has no sodium in it, so it can help to correct them um, pretty well there. Okay, um, so any questions on sodium homeostasis? Yes, ma'am. Um, um, essentially, it could be related back to, you know, if they're able to get enough um, water intake. Um, that was specifically maybe, actually, I'm probably meant hypervolemia on that one. Yeah, because again, if they're holding on to more sodium and, and water, yeah, I'll correct that on the on the slide when I put that up, but just be aware um, that that would cause more hypervolemia. Thank you for catching that. Any other questions? Okay, uh, if not, I will see you guys on Thursday. We'll start talking about urology. Uh, we'll go from there.